my name is Valerie and if you are new here, welcome. And if you are not new here, thank you for being one of my four subscribers I think I have now. If not, it's like three. But either way, um, thank you for clicking on my video. Um, in case you couldn't tell, I'm just going to be talking about a bunch of movies depending on whatever title I decide to give my video. Um, it's still undecided. But um, basically, I am no film major. I am no professional movie watcher. I am the average movie fan. And I don't really, I've never really taken any film classes or any courses like that. Um, I'm a business major. God, dear God. <laughs> um, I definitely don't know what I'm doing with this, but I still really like watching movies. I like watching a lot of different movies and I really wanted to talk about some of these films because I don't really see anyone talking about them. So I have here on my Chromebook uh, just really a bunch of movies that, movies that I listed. I have like 25 on here. If all 25 get onto this video, I feel like that's going to be like a miracle. But um, also, if you watched my first video, all seven views, all seven people, um, I am trying to figure out where to record. So this is like in my living room and I'm just gonna see if it works or not. Um, it's a high ceiling, so I'm gonna see if it has too much of an echo. If it does, I'll try to figure out another location. So we're gonna talk about some movies. I'm gonna describe them. Um, and hopefully I'm gonna get anyone who watches this to maybe give one or two of them a shot. I definitely think that these are my favorite, but they're also gonna be listed in like no official order. I'm not gonna label them like one through 25 or anything like that because I think that they're all pretty good, but just in different ways. So going off what I have written on like my Chromebook, um, we're gonna start talking first off with um, the lore or in Polish as it's called, Sorki Dancingu which means the daughters of dancing. So I really like this movie because it was one of the first movies that I had watched back when I was really trying to get back into, or really just start getting into international films. Uh, this was after I had watched Amelie, but like I didn't really know what else was there outside of like French film. So it was really cool to be able to see um, the lure as like one of my very first like kind of unconventional high concept films. So basically the lure is a movie that's based off of the original Little Mermaid fairy tale and, and this is a Polish horror musical and it really goes hard into the whole musical thing. I think the songs are absolutely gorgeous, like 10 out of 10 rec would recommend them on Spotify. Everything from the visuals to the music, to the special effects and costume design, there's something just really magical about this movie that I think everyone should be able to experience, even if it isn't exactly something that you would try to look for on your own. The movie is definitely for an adult audience and it doesn't stray away from adult concepts, but basically it's set in the 1980s and it's about two sisters, Golden and Silver, joining a strip club rock band called Figs and Dates, where they lure the guests in because of their vocal strengths as sirens. During their gig, Silver falls in love with the bassist Matic, but he only sees her as a fish, even when she's in her human form. From there, we're given background that in this universe, mermaids are able to transform into humans, but they can only do so through a surgical procedure, and even then, they still have a chance of turning into sea foam if they don't succeed in their love. Through this, we get kind of glimpses as to what a successful transformation looks like through the character Triton, where honestly, he has the coolest look in the entire movie. Like, my god, they went all out with him. I really recommend this movie for anyone who's more into absurdist films, anything that's like high concept, anything that's like a musical to be honest. And if you're looking for something really unique and something that's really devoted to what it's trying to do, even if it's kind of absurd, I would really recommend watching The Lure. I really recommend it really for anyone who's interested in it. There's really not much else I can say other than like, please go watch it and please, please, please listen to Give Me the Night and Policewoman and The Loop. They're all on Spotify under the soundtrack and it's really just incredible. So next we have Warm Bodies from 2013, featuring a British teen heartthrob starring as a zombie who was recently turned in an airport. He can only remember that the first letter of his name is the letter R. He's trapped in an airport, he only listens to vinyls because he thinks the sound is better, and he's a romantic at heart. Like literally what more could you want? And you know that the book is good. Like I'm saying it right now, go read the book. Like if you're not going to watch the movie, go read the book. 
The movie follows after a zombie apocalypse through the perspective of our main character, R, a guy who was recently turned at the airport, but because of the way that zombies function in this movie, he actually doesn't remember what his name is outside of the letter R. He keeps a few quirks like I mentioned, he listens to vinyls, he collects memorabilia from the airport to store in this empty airplane that he like kind of sleeps in, but not really because zombies don't sleep in this movie. And he falls in love with our Julie, the daughter of Colonel Grigio, the leading man to a group of survivors fighting against zombies. Honestly, I think this movie needs like a revival the same way that we've been having one with Twilight. Like, if anything, give it to give it to warm bodies. It hit. It was a good movie. Like I, I miss it. I miss the drama of I miss I miss all of it. I miss like just being able to read it and see it for the first time and like me going crazy after seeing the trailer because I, I went insane after I read the book. The zombies literally become human again by falling in love and feeling emotions. What more could you ask for? 10 out of 10, all five stars. Like honestly, even if zombies aren't your thing, like the movie was well received. It has like a 90%. Like literally, like you have nothing to lose. Please watch this movie. I am begging you. I am on my hands and knees please watch this movie. And also while you're at it, please read the book by Isaac Marion. Um, he really deserves it. He really wrote such a good character introspection on R that I kind of wish that the movie could have done, but because of cinematic limitations, it wasn't able to, which is, I think, the biggest tragedy. So up next is House, a movie from 1977, directed by uh, Nobuhiko Obayashi, who created a comedy horror which stars seven girls gorgeous kung fu professor fantasy melody mac and sweet who visit the house of gorgeous's aunt during their summer vacation in the house they slowly start disappearing one by one with spiritual beings attacking them as the girls try to figure out what's going on and try to save themselves before things get worse so this film was actually made after nobuhiko talked to his daughter who was a teenager at the time like 13 to 14 years old and she described to him that adults only think about things that they understand, that everything stays on the same boring human level. And so a lot of notable scenes from the movie actually come from childhood fears that she confessed to him. For example, about a pile of futons falling on top of her like a monster, a loud clock at her grandparents' home that she didn't like, and the fear of her fingers getting caught in between her piano keys when she played them. Um, so as you can see, this film is honestly really stylish and creative and for the time being I actually haven't been able to find anything that was done the way this was in particular, especially with the kind of computer generated scenes, the kind of crazy convoluted psychedelic Im imagery, and just in general the way that they did this, I think it's really fun and I think it's really cool and quirky. I don't really see people talk about this movie either. I'm hoping that because it's on HBO Max now, more people might, but even then, it looks a little odd from the poster. So I'm hoping that maybe this movie can get someone to talk about it. Also, I think it's really interesting because the director actually thought that giving it an English name would make the movie more taboo in Japan, since at the time there was no such thing as a Japanese movie that had a non-Japanese title. So I thought that was like a little thing that was kind of interesting, but anyways, uh, 10 out of 10, like all of these movies, 10 out of 10, I recommend it really strongly and I just think it's really fun and quirky and I just really love the way that they directed this. This movie isn't anything that I would consider scary by any means, like yeah it has the horror label but like it's not scary and also it's from the 70s. No movie from the 70s is still scary. Like, we have to be honest with ourselves. This is a personal favorite of mine, but this movie is The Willoughbys from 2020. So this is based off Louis Lowey's book. So I like to imagine that this movie and book are basically the a series of unfortunate events for kids who were born in time to be in elementary school in like 2010. Like, this is their version of it. And I say that because when I described this plot to a friend, she said to me, oh my god, this is a kids movie. Basically, it's about these four kids, uh, Tim, Jame, and Barnaby A and B Willoughby, who are the unwanted children of Walter and Helga Willoughby, two abusive parents who neglect their children and severely mistreat them. The kids, out of hatred and desire to get rid of their parents, decide to make a fake travel brochure that actually is meant to take them around the world's most dangerous locations 
in hopes that one of these locations will kill them. So this movie is really fun, like I swear, I promise. <laughs> Before the parents leave, they hire a nanny who takes on the responsibility of showing these kids that there are good adults out there in the world who do genuinely want what's best for you, but that at the end of the day, you just have to be able to look for them. I do believe that you do need to be a little unknowing of what the plot is for it to really work out. So this movie is actually on my suggested because I think the humor is so dry and witty and honestly it's nothing like what I expected it to be. I remember when the trailer came out like a little bit before it was revealed on Netflix and I just kind of brushed it off as like another kid movie and I remember I watched it because I just thought it looked really cute and I really liked the way that the designs make them look like they're made out of yarn but um, honestly it's such a good film in general I think it has such a sweet message and it's honestly so well done I really really recommend this movie and I recommend giving Lewis's book a try um, I wasn't aware of this until like I looked up the book but they also wrote The Giver if that makes any sense to anyone but um I really recommend this movie just for anyone who wants something kind of fun, something kind of sweet. Did I cry at the end of the movie? Yes, but like I cry at the end of every movie. I cried at the end of Peanuts. Um, I really recommend this movie. Also, I just really love the way that the house is designed. Like they really brought back maximalism in this and like, oh my god, I want my house to look like that. Casting John Binet from 2017. So I found out about this documentary a little bit before it came out because the trailer had been put onto Tumblr and people went like crazy over it. People were talking about like saving the movie, wanting to go to like a film festival to watch it. Like the reaction was really crazy. And so I remember I saw the video, I watched the trailer, and then what did I do? I saved it. And then I saved it and then I told myself, I'm going to watch it when it comes out. And then it came out and I never watched it until quarantine happened. And then quarantine happened and I finally watched it and oh my god, why did I wait to watch it? So I honestly should have watched this a day it came out. But basically, the film is under the documentary genre, but I've never really seen a documentary done like this. Basically, the point of the film is that it tries to get across how we in modern times, not just with John Binet's tragic death, but with all true crime, never really let the victims rest. We've created a pop culture phenomenon about a little girl who was found dead in her basement, and instead of wishing for her to rest and for the healing process to begin, we've created conspiracy theories and obsession over wondering who actually committed this horrible crime. We see this through a casting call for the roles of the father, mother, brother, Santas, police officials, and these little glimpses of little girls trying to be cast as John Binet. But we actually never get to see the little girls or get to see any of them be interviewed. What we see instead are all of these actors and actresses forgetting the reality that this was a real life case, a real life tragedy, that happened to a little girl and instead it's just another role to them it's another chance to get into the spotlight and it leaves you with this really eerie feeling that we kind of we kind of at this point do what these actors are doing what every time that we go turn on the news and watch unsolved mysteries or we try to listen to my favorite murder on a podcast you know what I mean? It's kind of this glamorization of a tragedy and we never really let these families rest. It's disturbing in a way I can't really put my finger on and all I can really say is that it's something that I think we all need to watch and something that we all need to be self-aware about enough for us to really understand what it is that it's talking about. Uh, another movie that I super recommend, uh, definitely watch this with like a friend or something just so you guys can talk about it because that's what I did and I think it really improved just the reactions to everything. We have Christine, a movie from 2016. Uh, this is directed by Antonio Campos with Rebecca Hall who stars in this biographic drama about Christine Kubik, a news reporter in Sarasota, Florida in 1974. So this one I actually suggest you go into blindly because honestly I feel like there's no other way to watch this movie and because of that I think this will be my shortest review slash introduction slash explanation of it. Um, I really wholeheartedly recommend this. Just, just go into it. 
don't 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 think about it just go into it like please trust me on this do not google it do not research it do not look her up do not wikipedia it like just go into it blindly you look up the movie you click on the first link and you're done Christine wants to be a reporter who is able to talk about more serious subjects on her news channel, but she's struggling to find satisfaction not only there, but in her day-to-day -day life as well. So Rebecca Hall honestly sells this, like she is such a spectacular actress in this movie and she deserves every, every award, give her every award. She did so good in this and she really made me forget for a couple moments that this is a biography. Um, again, why I really recommend watching this movie and going into it blind. Please try to go into it blind. I honestly cannot, I honestly cannot stress enough. Like, please go into it blind. Like, you, you will, you will thank me for going into this blind. My only warning is that there is violence at the very end. That's like the only warning I can give you. Persepolis from 2007 is a biographical drama based off of Marjane Satrapi's uh, biographical graphic novel, which I also strongly recommend, especially one of her other books called Embroideries. Um, starting off at the age of 10, up until her 20s, we're introduced to Marjane's early life in Tehran, Iran, where in 1979 we witnessed from her perspective as a child the Iranian revolution against the Shah of Iran. From here, Marjane's innocence is shifted and changed as she grows up and sees more and more and more of the tragedies her family and country experience once Islamic fundamentalists win the national election and begin to impose a strict Islamic law. She listens to her uncle who escaped prison after nine years of incarceration, bombings and destruction of her neighborhoods, and the death of an uncle who's unable to cross the border into England for a surgery because of nepotism in their board of health. In the film, we see Marjane as a rebellious girl wanting to show her hair under her hijab. She listens to American rock and metal, and she participates in the black market for American or just in general foreign media, even though that could get her into a lot of very, very, very dangerous trouble. But eventually things become too dangerous and her parents send her off to Austria in hopes of keeping her safe. This movie in particular hits me kind of close because a lot of what we see in the film, especially with the destruction of her neighborhoods and this fear put into her family and her friends, people immigrating just to hope that they can find some solace, um, it all hits a little too close to me sometimes just because, um, just because of the things that my family has experienced after, before and after moving from Venezuela, uh, especially with everything going on there right now. and even back when they were leaving in the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, this is just in general a movie that I think belongs on this list not only because of what it talks about but because of what it's trying to say and just the importance of listening to other stories and having a chance to hear about the experiences that someone had that we might have never known about. This movie and the novel are both banned in Iran and only recently, I believe two or so years ago, the ban was lifted because so many people had fought against the ban of this book. So I think that kind of shows something for the story and what it's trying to talk about. Um, I really recommend this and this is one of the movies where I say that just because it's animated doesn't mean that it's not a movie that adults can't enjoy. A lot of movies I think get a bad rap because of that and even Marjane herself acknowledges that we try to put this kind of realm of uh, of maturity onto books and movies and things that we read by just changing a single word. Uh, she even calls her books, she calls them comic books instead of graphic novels because at the end of the day that's what they are and there is no shame in wanting to read a comic book or wanting to watch a cartoon. The Lizzie McGuire movie. Okay. So imagine you're me in middle school and you just went on to the Disney Channel and you're waiting for like the new decom movie to show up on the screen. And now all you see on screen are like all of these kids like jumping around inside of like movie reels and one of them does the splits and like another one's doing a backflip and then it goes black. And all you see is the Lizzie McGuire movie up there in the title description and for the rest of the movie all you're doing is trying to get onto your home computer and try to figure out where the hell you can get that
that black and pink outfit from the beginning of the movie. Literally, where can I buy that? If anyone knows where I can get that outfit, please tell me. But anyways, um, I do not care that this movie has a 40%. I do not care that people look down on Disney Channel movies. And I do not care that it does not make sense for a bunch of middle schoolers to not only have the ability to go to Rome as a middle school graduation trip, but that half of the middle schoolers who had the option chose to go to a water park instead of a trip to Rome. So honestly, this movie is like my fantasy. And oh my god, I will live vicariously through Lizzie McGuire. Every time that I watch this movie, I am pretending that that is me and that I am the one who was mistaken for an international pop star. That is what I deserve. <laughs> this movie is here like amongst all of these European international film winners and like these Asian cult classics because I honestly think that a movie doesn't have to be good for it to be good. You know what I mean? I think we're all kind of... I think we're all just kind of afraid at times to admit that we really like movies like this and I feel like there is no shame in enjoying these movies that are very obviously very nostalgic for us or they're not, you know, the most incredible, amazing, well-made movies in the world. These, this isn't film material, but like it's a nice thing to watch and I think we all deserve, you know, on the occasion, a nice thing to watch, you know? like. Sometimes we can just bundle up and sit in bed and watch as a 16 year old girl playing a 13 year old gets confused to be like an international pop star and she has to take her place at a concert so that way she can save the musical career of a different international pop star. Like it's just a fun time and like not to mention watching Hilary Duff sing what dreams are made of is Oscar worthy. Like. Truly, the fact that she did not win an award, like, we've already lost. We were cheated out of that. Sympathy for Lady Vengeance from 2005. This psychological thriller directed by Park Chan-wook is his third and final installment of his Vengeance trilogy, featuring Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance and Old Boy, which I, I strongly recommend both of them. They're honestly amazing movies. And this one is all about Lee Gumja. A woman who's seeking out vengeance once she's released from a 13-year prison stay after she'd been wrongly accused of the kidnapping and murder of a six-year-old boy. Throughout the film we see her plans for action unfold as we're fed bits and pieces of what truly happened to the victim from 13 years ago. As a detective on her case explains the situation, we begin to realize that Lee was actually coerced into a false confession to let the true murderer run off free threatened by an unknown reason. The movie is honestly amazing to watch and I feel like kind of similar to the Scott Pilgrim series. I feel like uh, especially the Vengeance trilogy with uh, Old Boy, I feel like these are a little less I need to sell it to you and more like I need to tell you why this is my favorite. And it's just my favorite because it's another film that I would put under my little made-up category of hyperpop films, uh, basically meaning that it's just super stylish, it's super well done. I think that the character acting was spectacular. They really, really made it all feel a little too real at times, uh, despite kind of the campy nature of this movie, which also does take into consideration kind of what I see in a lot of Korean movies, which is trying to make things a little funny, even when you don't think that they're supposed to be, just because of the way that it's directed. I also think it's just super interesting that they did this thing where at the beginning of the movie it's in full color and then as time passes it gets a gradual shift into black and white and I know that there's two versions, one that does this and one that doesn't, but honestly I think the one that does it is like the actual version that everyone should watch. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World I don't have to introduce this movie, I feel like everyone watching this already knows what it is and what it's about, especially considering the cult following that it's gotten and the recent release of the what was thought to be forgotten video game that people thought was just lost, extinct basically. And I feel like there is really no need for me to talk about the movie in that sense, like there's no need for me to explain to you what the movie is, so I'm gonna talk about what I like about it because that's what we're here to do. So the thing about this movie is that it actually made me want to try to label movies that made me feel the same way in terms of visual concept 
and I know that sounds super stupid of me to do, but basically I gave it the label Hyperfilm because I couldn't think of anything better. So taking the concept of Hyperpop, one of my friends suggested me making an entire video devoted to this concept. What I mean by this is just a really simple idea. It's the name I'm giving films that are so hyper stylized that the movie just really wouldn't be what it is without the style in place. Like to give an example, Scott Pilgrim relies so heavily on visual art, pixel styles, visual cues, and it references the comic more often than some people would realize. The CGI renders are done with purpose and are meant to look a very specific way to reference a very specific style of video game art, mostly 8-bit and 18-bit, which I thought was super interesting. Um, not to mention the comic book art done at the time. Basically, this movie wouldn't be what we know it as without the vision of Fraser Churchill, who assisted in the making of it. He described it as a hard-to-produce movie and something that used very high-tech images with a very, a very lo-fi feel, which honestly I think is what made it age so well. It's not trying to be realistic, it's just trying to be recognizable. It's trying to be stylish. Um, if you haven't watched it, I strongly recommend it, but honestly, you don't need a recommendation to probably have already seen it. Tokyo Gore Police from 2018. Directed by Yoshihiro Nishimura, this is an action splatter film set in the near future Japan where a mad scientist by the name of Keyman has unleashed a virus that makes any human who contracts it an engineer. These engineers are humans who are able to, after an infection, make any form of weaponry sprout out of their body from any injury they have. Ruka, a member of the Tokyo Gore Police, is out hunting for the one who killed her father all while tracking down, down on engineers and searching for where the key man is located. So you can imagine this film is super convoluted and honestly it's really crazy to watch. Um, especially with how the film is stylized, it's again something I would call hyperfilm. They go crazy with colors, they go crazy with wardrobe, the scenes are so chaotic, the way that the cameras are directed and located just really makes things feel super high paced and high tense. Um, it's really something that I love for its high concept backgrounds and character acting. So this film is actually a remake of a shorter version that the director made himself, which was called um, Anatomia Extinction, but that's for all the way from 1995. So Yoshihiro actually has a history with special effects and makeup effects and I think it really shows with the way that effects are done on the weaponry when it comes out of the engineers bodies and the splatter effects you see when the gore police takes action. And oh my god do you love when they take action. <laughs> So this is one of those films that I don't really see people talk about when it comes to any discussions about the either East Asian sphere of filmmaking or even just the Japanese sphere of filmmaking. Not really a lot of people know about it, or if they do, they don't really talk about it very much, and I don't know why. I and to give kind of an example of how it makes you feel, I would say that like if you watch the scene in Battle Royale where the woman is giving the instructions to the kids in the classroom and she's dressed up the way she is and she talks the way that she does that's the entire movie but times 10 <laughs> so it's really really fun to watch i really recommend it i had a lot of fun talking about this and to be honest i would really love to be able to talk about some of these movies with you guys like down in the comments to all like four of my subscribers I would love to have a conversation with each of you individually. I promise, I promise that I will, uh, I'll reply. I have no reason not to, but um, I kind of hope that someone out there who watches this might be like, oh, I'll watch that movie, Valerie. I'll do that, you know? I'll watch that convoluted movie that you talked about right now. I would love to give an honorable mention to the movies that did not make it, including Shrek, Shrek 2, The Witch, and Shrek Forever After. Please watch all of those movies. <laughs> Do it for me. But anyways, I had a lot of fun talking about this, honestly. Um, I don't really know if I'm gonna record here again. I feel like I have too much of an echo and the sun kind of gets in my way a little bit, so it's not the easiest to take like videos in. But, and also this plant kind of gets in to my hair, so that's not really fun either. But I'm gonna try to figure out where I can record. I'm gonna try my bedroom next time. I'm gonna see what happens. Um, but either way, I had a lot of fun talking about this, and I hope you guys had fun listening, maybe watching. Who knows if I who knows if I edit this video well enough to watch it, let alone listen to it. But um, 
if you guys want to talk about the movies in the comments or maybe like you want to recommend me a movie i would love to talk about that but either way i want to say thank you for watching and i hope you guys come back again soon bye